Can you spot an empty church? We can all tell when the church is lacking in people, but what about when a church has lost its way and the people in it are subscribed to an empty religion? Uh, just looking around the l- religious landscape today, uh, this sure does seem to be a lot of what's going on. Uh, we predominantly call ourselves Christians, but what meaning, impact, or fullness and color does that bring to our lives? We read so often in the news about Christian leaders and denominations increasingly distancing themselves from truths that are clearly evident in Scripture and, and, and then dividing, deconstructing, or deconverting all together. So what do we do with this reality? It can sure feel discouraging to think about it, right? We all have eyes. We see these things going on. But why are we discouraged? And I think because we have a, a love of our fellow man. We have a love of our country, a love of our neighbor. And, and um, God put that love in our hearts for those around us, and it hurts us to see them on a path of destruction, especially when they mi- misrepresent our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, there's also a, a, a shock value, as if Satan is winning over the world and we're losing. But we can look back at the words of Christ in Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14, where Jesus said, Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, but narrow is the path to life, and few find it. We shouldn't really be shocked or surprised at the state of the church today. Jesus is in control and fully aware of the tendency of the human heart to go astray. And there's a couple really important things about this passage, and we use the segue into our time in Acts this morning. And the, the first is that it begins with what we can do, enter through the narrow gate. Now, we can't choose what other people will do, and we're not responsible ultimately for the decisions. That's between them and God. Uh, even, uh, even our children, I cannot make my children do anything. And what they want to do is, it, what they choose to do is between them and God. And, and, and we're responsible before God for every one of our decisions. And that's tough enough, isn't it? The second really important reality is what follows in Matthew 7, verses 15 through 20. And Jesus tells us to watch out for false prophets who come in sheep's clothing, but are in fact ferocious wolves. You see something wrong with this picture up here? Hopefully we do, right? If not, there's a good time to wake up and realize that is not a sheep on the screen. It is a wolf in sheep's clothing. And wouldn't it be awesome if we could identify the kind of people Jesus warned us about just by looking at them? Oh, that's clearly heretical. Oh, this person is, is obviously not a believer and we should stay away, should not put, put them in authority over our lives. Jesus told us that we actually can identify, if we look close enough, we can identify false religion by its fruit. And for a good bit of help, we'll, we, we see what false religion in action looks like in Acts chapter four. And so how do we spot empty religion. Specifically, looking at these two questions. Um, and then also, how can we make sure that we are on the right path? Uh, sometimes it's a lot easier to, to, to see the, the uh, apostasy of those around us than when we own, in our own hearts are drifting away from God's truth. So let's make sure that we're on the narrow road together this morning and taking our family and friends and loved ones with us. We're looking at four marks of empty religion we look at uh, four marks of the religious authorities to the healing of a lame man in chapter three. And, and knowing these will be very helpful in identifying empty religion in others as well as guarding our hearts from veering off the narrow path. Now, I love these summary slides. I hope you don't get bored of them yet. But just as a reminder, when we open up the book of Acts, what we are holding in our hands is eyewitness testimony that's carefully curated by, by Luke the physician and traveling companion of Paul just a few decades after Jesus' death and resurrection. And he's writing it to a real person, wanting to really communicate the the history of the church, and by God's grace, we have this record with us this morning. And so it's wonderful. So as we are are, uh, looking at this story, we can have confidence knowing that this is eyewitness testimony. The people that we're hearing from this morning Uh, This testimony of people that are actually there. So it's very, very important. 
Uh, now, if, if, we, if we veer off just a little bit away from eyewitness testimony, we can go to the testimony of our children regarding the story last week. It all started with Jesus dying and rising again and ascending into heaven, and the disciples were super, super excited. There's rainbows everywhere, and they're filled with the love and the power of God, and, and then we see in Acts chapter 2, Pentecost, which the... Uh, the, the human heart was filled with the Holy Spirit. As you could tell, that if you have the Holy Spirit in, alive and active in your heart, it looks like a rainbow. So uh, that's what happens in our heart. And uh, they're all together in unity and love. And then we get to a good comic strip here that I want to walk you guys through. And so all this happiness is happening, and the disciples and the apostles are all excited. And they are walking into the temple around three in the afternoon to go pray. And they run across a lame man. And, and one day uh, he says, I can't walk, and I love this. You see how flat he is on the ground? He's not even sitting up. He's just completely flat. It wasn't just his legs, but his arms, and everything about him was just lame. And then he says, money and food, please. Uh, And then the the disciples say, look at us. Uh, And then they say, get up in the name of Jesus. And I love what the lame guy says on the screen. He says, I can't. (laughs) Because that's not when he was healed. He wasn't healed until Peter reached down and began to pulling him up, at least when you look at the the text. And so it was in the act of Peter helping him to his feet that instantly his feet and ankles grew strong. And just, you can't see it from here. So I zoomed in. Look at the face of the lame man. Look at his face. It's fantastic. It comes up here. There it is. You guys like that? Huge eyes, eyes are as big as his head, and like a, it looks kind of like a frog. <laughs> so it's, it's pretty amazing. And so he's so excited and happy that he runs and he leaps around, and he's, he's like, what? What just happened? And, and he's saying, thank you, as he runs off in the sunset. That's not exactly what happened. Uh, and so then he's doing, either, I don't know if it's a handstand or a backflip, but he's very excited, and he's saying, yay. And, and what's great about getting, getting the, this from a perspective of a child is, is they really get it. Like, how excited would you be if you're lame for 40 years of your life and all of a sudden you are miraculously healed? Like, this, he's just going nuts. He's so excited, and the children did a good job of capturing that. Now, uh, I love <laughs> reading at the bottom of the, of the picture on the left here. Uh, one of the children said, what I learned was poor, 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 poor. That's not exactly what I was, the point I was trying to get across. Yes, yes, John and Peter says we have no silver and we have no gold. We're poor. That's not the point of the passage. Uh, true, we are poor, but we are rich in Christ. And on the right side, we see that the lame man is excited. He's saying, God is with me. He's with us. Uh, that the lame man went from begging to being very happy. And he's got a new truck as well. And uh, I was always wondering what the name of the lame man was, but right here, you've got it. Right over the lame man, his name is there. Jonathan, 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 yep, yep, yay. That's his name that we see here. Um, good drawings here. Uh, that none of, that one of the main points is that none of us have any power in and of ourselves. No matter how godly or religious we might think that we are, it is only by the name of Jesus that we experience healing. And if the apostles Peter and John said that, I think we could probably say that too. That it's in the, in the name of Jesus that is powerful. And it's incredibly freeing to say, I am inadequate in and of myself to do ministry, and therefore we must pray and ask the Lord to move in ways we can't. We want supernatural healing, not just natural persuasion or accomplishments. And we can trust that God will hear our prayers That God sees us, he listens to us, he'll answer in his way and in his timing. And we can also recognize the healing he's already done in our hearts. Uh, Not many of us have ever been lame in our lives and be able to stand up and walk, but we've experienced the forgiveness of the Lord, those that have put our faith in Jesus, and experienced that healing, forgiveness, that peace. We've seen God move in different ways. And we should be ready to tell others with our testimonies, like the leaping lame man who is praising God in the temple, he was making a big scene. I really like that picture of the backflip slash handstand. He was, he was really going nuts, and he was drawing a big crowd. But not everyone was happy. The wolves in sheep clothing were, were closing in, and we see, first of all, a display of power politics. Looking at verse, in chapter 4, verse 1, 
the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. And so here they are, they're in the temple. And here's a picture, they're probably in the temple courts. And, and, uh, and then the, uh, you'd expect the religious leaders to be excited about the healing in Jesus' name, but they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. These teachers seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. There's a few things that's really important to notice here. One is that Peter and John were preaching a long sermon. How many of you guys like long sermons? Yes, yes. They were going three hours. We're not going three hours this morning, but they were going a long time. Three hours they were devoted of, of preaching to the people, street preaching at least from three o'clock to six o'clock because that's when they consider night. They arrived at three in the afternoon and they're going till the evening and to have been evangelizing and energizing the crowd, getting a really good response. And it was too late to convene an official meeting, so what did they do? They just threw the apostles in jail. They put them in chains and they made them spend the night. It's the first recorded instance of persecution after the birth of the church. It's right here in Acts chapter four. Was that effective? We see in the next verse, no, but many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to be about 5,000. And the next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. So the next morning they woke up, what do we do with this? Bring the guys back out again. And Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name do you do this? There's a lot of stuff happening here in this first seven verses. One really important first question we ought to be asking is, who were these guys? Who were these guys? Because they sure know how to ruin a party. And that they just came in on the scene and started throwing the apostles in jail. And and so as we walk through these verses together, first we see in verse one, we see three categories of of religious authorities. Uh, First we see the priests. The priests were there. This is a really big deal. The priest would be, the closest equivalent would be an ordained pastor in modern day uh, America. Somebody who's been through all the training and who's supposed to know what what God's word says. He communicates it to the people. Uh, He's got uh, a red phone on his desk that directly goes to God. I don't have one of those. Uh, but uh, they, they would be, the, the priests would be the uh, representatives to God before the people. They would, make, they would make sacrifices, and they were chosen, they were of an a, a important lineage coming from the line of Aaron, and they're set apart uh, as holy before God. And, and you would look, in, in this day, if you're wanting to look for a godly person, you would look for a priest, somebody who really knew the Torah well and followed it and was teaching and all that, so so you've got these religious leaders, the priests, came out. Also, you've got the captain of the temple guard. The captain of the temple guard was, uh, was also a priest, would have been probably second to the high priest. And his job, as you would just get from a surface level reading, is he was the captain of the temple police force. And his job was to provide security and order in the temple. And he was to remove threats from the temple. And so just the fact that he's mentioned, it says that these priests are ready to do business. They're ready to do battle. They're ready to forcibly remove and incarcerate these apostles and, and, and try to s- settle things down. So they're, they're, wanting to inf- they're wanting to bring force in the situation. We also see the, the Sadducees here. The Sadducees were, were elite. Uh, they were wealthy religious leaders. They were well-educated Jews. They are very powerful Many of them are priests. They're kind of like the progressive wing of the Jews of the day. They were about compromising with Rome to protect the people, to, to have the best possible situation. They would strike deals with Herod uh, to decorate the temple, make it wonderful. So they were, they were very politically connected. And they, didn't, they, <laughs> uh, they did not believe in the resurrection. And so they were all about just complete what, what you see, what you touch, what you smell. They're all about the scientific method, all these things. They're just, hey, if you can't see, it doesn't exist. So they were, they were very much what's here now. And they only believed in the Torah. That's, that's really interesting, is that all the rest of the books in the Old Testament, they pretty much just chunked as 
myths or whatnot. And so uh, the Sadducees were involved on the scene. We see in verse five kind of a catch-all of the people that were there. It says that there's rulers, there's elders, the teachers of the law. Uh, this would have certainly included the Sanhedrin, which is 71 people, would have, would have been there to, to, to have the official ruling group, the rulers. And so it would have been a huge group. And these are the religious authorities of the day, they're teachers of the day, they're, they're leading prayers and sacrifices, they're public figures, they're saying and doing all the right things. And going by position and appearance and power, these are the godly people that you were not allowed to question. And so you, these are the authorities. Picture yourself uh, being in my shoes this morning and looking out in front of a hostile crowd. You guys aren't hostile, thank you. I'm very grateful that you're not. But just the, the, the fact that it would be so intimidating to be surrounded by all these people and all this power, and they're, they're very, very angry at Peter and John. And they, they, they came and it was intimidating. And, and then you have, uh, kind of to cap it all off, in verse six, we see the, the high priest and his family. We've got uh, Annas, who is the current acting high priest. Uh, his, excuse me, Caiaphas is the acting high priest. Annas' father-in-law was a previous high priest that had been deposed by Pontius Pilate's uh, predecessor. And so you really have two high priests that are there, and we see them both called high priest in the Gospels. And then you've got uh, their family, uh, probably Jonathan and Alexander. There's some part of the high priest family. Uh, these were the priests of priests. These were the big guys. These are the, the one religious leader you do not cross uh, they had the responsibility of entering the Holy of Holies in the presence of God once a year on the Day of Atonement. They would step into the presence of the Holy Spirit. Everyone else would look up to them. Uh, Annas is the one, by the way, who tore his clothing at the trial of Jesus. Uh, and, and that's essentially what, what sent Jesus to the cross, is that sham trial. This is an intimidating group. So imagine being put in front of these guys, full of anger, is also the exact same group that crucified Jesus just a few weeks earlier. Peter and John are in hot water from a human standpoint. They are in deep, deep trouble. And so you got all these people, the power of politics, and they were deeply disturbed. Uh, you could say that they were irate, they were provoked, they were vexed, angry, and exasperated. Uh, you could put in an American... Uh, slang today. They had lost their ever-living minds. So what makes you lose your mind? We can have a little interaction this morning. It's fine. So what makes you lose your mind? How about tra anyone, anyone uh, traffic makes you lose your mind? How about gas prices? <laughs> what about uh, politics? So just think about the things that irritate you and, and just dwell on that for a few seconds and, and you're fully angry then you can relate to how these guys felt. They're irate, they're provoked, very angry, because these were unauthorized messengers. They had no formal training. They were not part of the, of the powerful groups. They hadn't sat under a rabbi for many years. What did they know? These messengers were, were nothing. Uh, the message uh, that they were giving was that of uh, Jesus, sa Jesus saves, this would have been especially angering for the Sadducees because the Sadducees believed there was no resurrection. And so here you've got a clear exhibit A of death and resurrection in Jesus. You've got an empty tomb and none of them can pull out a body. There's nothing they can do to that, so they're very, very angry. They're also very angry because of the popularity that these, the acclaim that these disciples are getting. Now it's fascinating when you look at archaeology uh, the, the highest possible estimates based on recent archaeology that I could find was that maybe Jerusalem might have had up to 100,000 people living in it around 33 AD. And so it's probably a lot less than that. That's important because we see that 5,000 men were saved. 5,000 men had embraced the name of Jesus. And that number escalated from Acts 2.41 where we see 3,000 men saved. So God is adding daily to this church that is growing exponentially. And if you have 100,000 people in Jerusalem, and if you've got 5,000 men who represent families, 
it's very probable that there was upwards of 20% of the population of Jerusalem had converted to Christianity. That's like one-fifth within a matter of weeks. It makes sense because you look at how public everything was. Jesus was publicly crucified. He's publicly teaching. You have Palm Sunday. All this, the body goes missing. Uh, The cowardly disciples now emboldened by the Holy Spirit. You've got the story of Judas being paid off and, and that being known all throughout Jerusalem. So this was a big, big public affair going on. And there's a massive revival. And this was threatening the power of the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the religious leaders. Imagine a 20% dip in your followers in the blink of an eye. They were panicked. They were afraid that this movement towards Christianity was called the way initially. And so the movement towards the way, towards Jesus, is threatening to upend all that the religious authorities stood for and all they worked so hard to build. If Jesus' fulfillment of the law for and, and, uh, and, f- and of all the sacrifices, then what need is there for the temple? Um, they have competing messages and mutually exclusive goals. And the Jewish goal was you gotta, be, you gotta follow the law and be a good person, and then God will accept you. Whereas in Jesus, it's we're all bad and we need his grace and mercy. Now, obviously there's still power politics today, right? Uh, it's... And so we need to protect ourselves from falling into this trap. Uh, and so we need to be very careful when, when looking at the messengers, looking at the messengers. Who do we allow to teach us? Or, or who, do we, who do we give authority to? What's the criteria? Uh, simply looking at religious reputation, having positions of authority or power, it's, it's, it's not always the, the right way to go. Uh, because again, in, the, in 33 AD, you would have looked at these, this religious group of people, the priests, and you would have said, hey, I need to listen to these people. And it's really important to really stop and consider who we follow, who are willing to put ourselves into the authority uh, under. Uh, a, way, a, way to re- a really good way to tell whether or not we should be listening to the messages of others is, what's the, what is their message? Is it promoting the name of Jesus Christ? Or is it promoting something else? Uh, Jesus plus, or grace plus, or gospel plus. Uh, maybe our, our own pet causes. Uh, you know, something I have to kind of check my own heart often when I'm preaching because uh, I have my pet peeves, I have my, my own opinions, and it's really important that, that what comes out of the pulpit is not of me, but of God. Now, now spoiler alert, I'm gonna, you're gonna hear me, <laughs> but try to see through me and see, see, to, see to scripture. Uh, do we clearly understand what's being said? Or are we just hearing a feel-good motivational message and then leaving? What is the message being conveyed? Uh, What are the the motives? What are the motives? It's really hard to judge the motive of somebody else. And I I think we need to be careful in doing that also, that we judge actions, not motives. But we can certainly judge our own motives. When we find ourselves welling up and we're greatly disturbed or irked, well, why? What is it? Like, is there something... Is something raw in me that's being exposed here by what's developing, and can I, can I give this to the Lord? What are my motives in this situation? And so it's really good to evaluate our own motives. Uh, how's a, a, a big litmus test is, is how's our prayer life? Um, am, I de- am I regularly declaring dependence upon the Lord and going to him for wisdom and guidance and leadership? Are we praying for discernment? Is the Holy Spirit convicting us when we're engaging in things that are not according to his will? Or are we subjecting ourselves to empty religion? How about the, the prayer life? And then here's something else that's really interesting. The, the Sadducees and the religious authorities, they looked down upon Peter and John because of the fact that they're ordinary, untrained men. Do we look down upon other people because maybe they, they don't look like us or talk like us, maybe they're not as educated as we are, maybe we haven't known them for 20 years? Who do we look down upon? It's very interesting because the pendulum goes both ways. You don't accept someone just because of their position. And it is helpful when someone has training and that's kind of a mark that they love the Lord and they want to grow. But the moment that we begin to tell people that they can't serve, what we're doing is we're actually blaspheming the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity. It's the power that anyone can serve. Even people like Peter and John. And, and leading them to do wonderful, incredible things. And so it's this, all this can be summarized just simply by prayer for discernment regarding who we allow to lead us and, and how we discern whether or not we should be listening to others. 
We can easily get caught up in the game of power politics today. We must be careful to ensure that our message and our motives are fully aligned with the gospel. And so here you, you have in this first section, you see these guys are all about power. And you see that they, were, they reject the message of the apostles. There's a rejection of Jesus. See, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people. He's responding to the question we see in verse seven, by what name or authority are you preaching these things? This is more of a rhetorical question that they're asking than anything else because it's very clear they're preaching the name of Jesus. That's all over Peter's sermon in Acts chapter three. He's saying it's not about us, it's about Jesus. And so this is a rhetorical question being asked by the Sadducees to try to trap Peter and John. They're wanting to catch them in the act of blasphemy so they could punish them severely, maybe even crucify them like they did Jesus. But then it's so cool, we see a different Peter than we've ever seen before. Remember the, the Peter, the, the last time he was confronted by anybody, he was confronted by a slave girl who said, oh, you're, not, you're not a Galilean, you're not one of the people following Jesus. And what did Peter do? He fled. But here you see a Peter who's full of the Holy Spirit. Now he's already, been, he's already received the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter two. And so we see something a little different here. And it's interesting, and, and I just encourage you to do your own word study or challenge yourself. What does this mean? What do you think this means? Uh, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, I think it's to allow the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us, to submit to it, to, to pray the Lord would lead us and convict us, to not push the Holy Spirit aside and just do whatever we want to, 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 to not be controlled by our flesh. And here, Peter is filled to the brim with the Holy Spirit, and he spoke out in power and authority. He needed the right words to say. Here's what he said. He said, if we're being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who is lame and are being asked how he was healed, if you're actually asking us this, or if we're actually on trial for, for this miraculous healing, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. So he comes out swinging. He says, you, know what, you wanna know where our power comes from? That guy that you crucified, that didn't stay dead. And he brought healing to this man right here. He's, and then he, he continues by quoting Psalm 118. He said, Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And so it's really important for us to understand the concept of cornerstone. And also Psalm 118, 22, which Peter quotes here. Psalm 118 is, uh, like all psalms, it's a, it's a beautiful psalm. It's one of praise. You're familiar with the first verse, even if you can't quote it off the top of your head. It says, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. It's a song that we like to sing. And that's how Psalm 118 begins. You know how it ends? It ends with, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, his love endures forever. This is a Hebrew poetry device called inclusio, and everything in between is about giving thanks to the Lord for his salvation. It says salvation is in the Lord alone. But also it says that not everyone embraces this salvation. And the surrounding nations were especially antagonistic towards Israel. You see them embracing false idols and, and, and not worshiping Yahweh. And so... This is the context of Psalm 118, saying the cornerstone Yahweh has been rejected by the nations and they missed out on the most important thing. But then here Peter's saying this applies to anyone regarding Jesus. This is, a, this is viewed as a, as a messianic psalm later on and it's saying here any, ultimately salvation is found in the anointed one alone and specifically that Jesus was the cornerstone. Does anyone know what a cornerstone is? Have you seen a cornerstone? Ivan, you're in construction. Anyone else in construction, you know what a cornerstone is? There's actually four different things that it could be in ancient times. You've got, uh, you're familiar with an arch. It's commonly referred to as the keystone or capstone. You've got arches, they're just kind of built. And then the last, the last stone that you have in an archway would be the, the capstone or keystone. And that would go right at the top and that would hold everything together. And if you took the capstone out, the whole thing would collapse. Um, but uh, most of the smart people 
and, and commentators and scholars are saying that probably what's most likely in view here is, is the cornerstone, uh, like literally stone at the corner. This would, this would be the first stone laid in the building. Think about how important that is. Because you've got the plans for the building, uh, but that first stone orients every other stone that's laid. The foundation, the location, it's so important. The cornerstone would ensure that the entire building was on a straight and level foundation. Critically important. And so this, Peter says, is Jesus. So we must build our lives around the Messiah, the anointed one, the cornerstone. But he said that this has been rejected by you. The word rejected, it, it's actually, it's strong in English, but it doesn't go, it's not strong enough, so I'll throw a whole bunch of synonyms out there. Uh, the despised one, a disdained one, that you've literally taken Christ as worthless or taken beyond worthless as harmful, as an enemy. You've discarded that it's beneath, uh, beneath consideration. Uh, children, have you, do you, you guys, you children like Legos? Children, okay. Any adults like Legos? Okay, maybe a few. Um, as an adult, you tend to hate Legos because they inflict massive damage on your feet. But uh, children, have you ever lost a Lego? Or you're like, or you're looking through your, le- your bags, okay, we got a lot of hands, you guys are engaged now. Or you got a lot of, got a lot of, of Legos in there, you're like, ah, oh, I don't know where this goes, I probably don't need it, and then you lose it. And then you're building that thing, and then you, you come to the end of the thing, if you're building a dinosaur, or spaceship, or truck, or whatever it is, and the whole thing is ruined because you despise that one Lego piece and you let it go. That's frustrating, right? Imagine this on a larger scale, okay? Uh, so uh, adults, we're, we're, we've got a home project or we're actually building something and we're building, we're building, we're building and we, we thought we had all the pieces together, we thought we had it all there and then we're missing that one thing and everything is worthless. It's really frustrating, right? It would have been terrible if you're actually in construction, you're building something that, that essentially what you've dedicated your life to for the last several weeks or months has become worthless because you missed the cornerstone. Well, what happens if we reject Jesus Christ as salvation, if we despise him? Salvation is found through Jesus alone. There is no other name under heaven by which we're saved. And so as big of, as frustrating as it is to not be able to put together a Lego piece or construction project, how disastrous is it that we are to fail at the one thing that we desperately need, which is relationship with Jesus Christ. There's just no replacement for Jesus. He leaves a great big gaping hole in our life. And this is all that matters. And yet we still reject Jesus today. It's very easy to do that. It's easy to discard. Now, maybe we don't despise Jesus, but it's easy to overlook. How? Well, morality and legalism. Yes, morality is good. It's good to be moral. It's good to follow the Ten Commandments. It's good to do these things. But so often, in fact, the, the dominant world religion is actually, it, it's, it's good works. If you're to ask anyone off the street, uh, if they're going to go to heaven, they'll probably say yes, and they'll probably say because I'm a good person or because I'm not, I've not murdered anyone. The statistics continually bear that out. Well over half, probably about three quarters of people typically say that. Um, but this is something that, are, that can also creep into the church, become more concerned about people's behavior than about their heart, and that's very, very dangerous. That's a rejection of Jesus to, to hyper-focus on works. We're saved by grace. Works are important, but they're not what save us. Uh, how about independence? The thought that we can do this on our own. That we're self-sufficient. We can decide what's true. That's a, that's a popular message today. Uh, your truth and my truth, our independence, we can do whatever we want to as long as we're not harming someone else, whatever that means. We're the ultimate arbiters of what's right or wrong. Uh, how about uh, comfort seeking? We profess Jesus with our lips, but deny him with our lifestyle. Uh, we build our own wealth, we focus on ourselves, our own pleasures. Um, you know, taking up our cross to follow Jesus is hard. And, but that's, what, that's true Christianity, that's what Jesus tells us to do, is take up your cross and follow me. And this is, 
having an intent to follow in his footsteps, who being in very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself a servant, even subjecting himself to death on a cross. That Christianity is not about comfort seeking, it's about the opposite of that. Stepping out and serving, evangelizing. It's about studying, listening, forgiving, apologizing, asking forgiveness when we need to. Yes, it is about obedience to commandments, even the hard ones. It's also about embracing God's grace. It's all too easy to sit down and rest for a while, to get into a retirement mentality, drop the cross, and prioritize our own comfort. I think it's a big reason why the big C church is the way it is today, because we really dropped the ball in discipleship. Uh, we can easily go into people pleasing. This is almost kind of the opposite. It's kind of, instead of being independent and kind of not caring what anyone else thinks, this is kind of dependent upon somebody else for validation. And it's focused on other people as if other people could save us. We look to the high priest to be the arbiter of truth. And we speak words that bring us praise or withhold honest feedback or we just judge people silently and not actually share what's on our heart because we want to people please and not irritate them. So it's really easy to reject Jesus and instead try to get the applause of people we could look at uh, tolerance as a rejection of Jesus. And you've, you've, I'm sure you've seen the definition of tolerance has changed. Instead of kind of putting up with or just kind of being okay with someone else, believing a certain thing, it's, uh, we need to tolerate as in endorse and rejoice in other people and encourage and embrace their lifestyles, which as Christians we can't do. We can allow all people freedom of religion and understand they're responsible to God for their decisions, as, as are we, but uh, it's easy to, to fall into this trap of, of we need to tolerate, we need to encourage or embrace sin, to call what's wrong right and what's right wrong. A lot of that's going on right now. Do we have the, do we have the uh, courage to speak out for truth and, and do so in love? And do we believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life? Salvation is found in no other name. Are we saying this or just thinking it? Um, I was reading uh, R.C. Sproul, one of his commentaries this last week, and in college, uh, he, he ran across a bitter professor uh, who was a, a war journalist who'd been and seen the horrors of war and all that, and, and, and this professor just let him have it uh, in the middle of class. Uh, do you believe that Jesus is the only way to salvation? And R.C. Sproul, he said in his commentary that with the, he, he mumbled yes, kind of put his hand in front of his mouth, just kind of was sheepish in that, he wasn't always the, the bold guy that we see today. Uh, and and, and the, that, prof- that professor in that class reamed him out. How dare you? I've never heard anything more ignorant or, or selfish or self-centered or closed-minded and bigoted as you just told me, a professor to young R.C. Sproul. If it happens to him, it's gonna happen to us as well. There's gonna be that push to tolerate, endorse, and embrace names other than Jesus for salvation. The name of Jesus must be and will be exalted over every other name. Salvation is found in no other place. Our Savior, God's Son, sent to rescue us from our sin and give us life, give life to all who believe in him. And so we see in in these religious leaders the power of politics going on, rejection of Jesus, but we see a great deal of confusion. This is when things get kind of comical as we just to kind of evaluate what happens when, when Peter and John strike back. Picking up in verse 13, when these religious leaders saw the courage of Peter and John and they realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. Isn't that cool? Where was the lame man who was healed? He was right there with them. What does this mean? That the lame man who was healed stuck with him. Either he was thrown in prison along with Peter and John, which I don't think that happened. Uh, I think that he came and continued to want to cling to and be a testimony and, and to stick with Jesus and to stick with Peter and stick with John. And he was right there in the midst of this sham trial. And, and they didn't know what to do, so the religious leaders ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then they conferred together, these 70 guys trying to figure out what do we do with all this? They said in verse 16, what are we going to do with these men? Everyone living in Jerusalem 
knows they have performed a notable sign and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. After they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus, but Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes? To listen to you or to listen to God? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. And after further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. You see, these, these, religious didn't, these religious leaders did not know what to do with Peter and John or the lame man. They didn't know what to do with Jesus. They were confused. Why are they confused? They saw incredible courage. Incredible courage. They saw confidence and boldness, fearlessness, determination, a willingness to defy authorities, put their necks on the line. And then, and then repeatedly, Peter and John are just not giving in to the threats. You imagine, like, we, we, we read, we don't know what those threats were. But you could probably fill in the blanks. They were not nice threats. It was not like, hey, you guys, if you could just keep it down a little bit, that'd be great. It was not like that. They've been threatening their lives and their loved ones. We're going to destroy you. Who are you? You're nobody. We, we crucified your master. We're going to crucify you too. I'm sure these threats were very pointed and severe. And for Peter and John to stand up against those threats, it's pretty inspiring. It's a good example for us to follow today. And, and the, the Sadducees are just confused at this courage. These guys would seriously rather die than stop speaking the name of Jesus. We cannot help but speak in what we have seen and what we've heard. Should we listen to you or God, they say. The, 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 the Pharisees and Sadducees were, were further confused because these were ordinary men. They're unschooled, ordinary men. And I think we've got some Greek scholars in here. So I'm going to give you a Greek word, and you tell me what it means. The Greek word for untrained, idiote. Idiote. What do you think that means? Idiot. Not a nice thing to say. What's interesting is that not only was that a very mean, and not only was that accurate and they're, they're untrained, but it's not a good connotation here, right? You idiot. You could have been saying morons. You go nothing. They're just thrashing out. But what's funny, who in this story thwarted their plans? The idiots did. <laughs> they can't get these morons to shut up. And so these, the fact that these are ordinary men and they're not morons, but in their mind they are because that's what they call them. They're untrained idiots. And these guys are defeating us with all the scholarship and power and prestige that we have as the priests and rulers of the people. These ordinary guys, they're, they're defeating us. We can't, we can't stop this. Why? Because this is a miracle that was done in public. Everyone could see and hear. Uh, and that's also pretty cool. We looked at last week how likely Jesus came by this guy waiting many times and he wasn't healed for 40 years and he probably prayed in that 40 years for healing and he never received it. This guy, because, because he was healed later in life, everyone knew that he was lame, but now everyone could see he was standing. It was a public miracle. 40 years of lameness reversed. How can we go against this? They're confused. They can't, they can't deny it. There's no stopping this. And so all they could muster was just empty threats. They don't try to discipline. They don't try to do anything except just empty words. That's all that they're doing. And, and ultimately, the confusion comes from the fact that, that what happened did not match their worldview. The worldview is that they were in charge. That they were the ones who knew God's word better than anybody else. And people should be listening to them and nobody else. Uh, their worldview is that, that God can, can't move outside of the trained religious authorities and the rituals and the regulations and the, the, the rules and the law. The worldview didn't match the reality because the Sadducees believed that there is no resurrection from the dead and yet very clearly there's an empty tomb. What do you do with that? And now the, the guy who, who came out of that tomb is now healing people it's just, their minds were literally blown. It didn't add up. They were confused and they were paralyzed and powerless in the face of the idiote. 
Do we have confusion today? I sure think we do have a lot of confusion today. It's really important that we look at our own worldview. Our worldviews can, and in, in whether or not it's biblical, can really get us in a lot of trouble. Um, do we believe in the name of Jesus? Do we believe in the resurrection, the Holy Spirit, and God's word? Um, what's our worldview? What's the lens through which we see the world? What makes sense of the world? Unfortunately, I think a very unbiblical worldview has been spreading among Christians, I think for several decades now. Do we believe that everyone who desires to live a godly life will avoid persecution? Why do we get so scared when we see Christians censored? We see sensing political tides turning against us. Will that shake us? Or we'll be like Peter and John, come what may, we cannot help but speak and declare what we've seen and heard. And even if there's great personal cost, will we have the boldness to proclaim God's goodness? Do we believe the best is yet to come? Do we believe there's salvation in another name? Do we believe that one day we're going to be in heaven with Jesus? That's our home, and we're aliens here. Is this our worldview? The world hates this worldview. The Bible must be our anchor. We must live, eat, breathe, sleep God's word and understand what it says. It's why uh, we, we try, I try as best as we can to teach scripture, to understand it. What's happening right now is so important because what we're doing is we're looking at the historical narrative of the early church and we're learning from it. We're trying to understand what God's word says where, the, where did the church come from? What are we supposed to do? And what, what we're finding this morning is you and I, if we're going to be authentic in our faith in Christianity, need, need to take a, a page from the courage of Peter and John and be willing to be persecuted for our faith. We've got to really learn and know and appreciate what the Bible says. Because if we do that, we're not going to be open to false teaching. Can we identify false teaching? False prophecy? There's just so much of it out there. Uh, from religious leaders as well as secular society and, and education today. There's so many false, horrible religious viewpoints that we could, we could fall into. Uh, we have uh, false hopes, uh, pinning our hopes on earthly reward and freedom, and that's an illusion. Here's a spoiler alert. In 100 years, we're all gonna be dead. Aren't you glad you came this morning? And our stuff is all gonna be owned by somebody else. Why do we focus so much on our temporary treasures? Why do we do that? We've bought into a worldview that does not align with, with Scripture. We've got something so much greater to live for, to get busy teaching and serving and discipling and enjoying the peace and the love only found in Christ. We've got doubt that, enter, that enters in and skepticism. Uh, one of Satan's favorite question, questions is, did God really say uh, our hearts are a battlefield for spiritual warfare. We must choose whom we will serve. Will we pray and ask the Lord to move or will we be swept away by doubt? Ultimately, it could be narrowed down to just simple self-focus. It's emptiness. If our hope here is advancement, if our hope is advancement here on earth, when we get hit with sickness and death, we have no answer and our faith is shaken when we have the, the health diagnosis or cancer, or whatever it is, or death, or these things that, that will hit all of us because death is certain. Resurrection is the only worldview with an answer. It's the only answer to this heartache and the pain we go through. So we see our loved ones decline and we decline ourselves. Are we gonna live for Jesus? And if, if, you, if you want further clarification on whether or not you've got a biblical worldview, I love the EFCA statement of faith. We're, our denomination is the Evangelical Free Church of America and we've got 10 things that are critically important that have been Orthodox Christian faith for a couple thousand years. The Bible is God's word, understanding the Trinity, salvation by grace through faith in Jesus, that Jesus is coming back and there's heaven, there's hell and we're saved by grace, all these things. So it's really important that we have a biblical worldview. We must have clarity in our lives, understanding that God is the author of truth. Satan loves lies and confusion. He's the author of lies. 
we, the father of lies. We must match up our lives against the truth of God's word and live accordingly. So these religious leaders are confused, but they're also living just for great vanity. Upon the release of Peter and John, they went back to their own people and reported all the chief priests and the elders had said to them. It's just interesting to pause and you wonder, what's the response gonna be of their fellow Christians? What's gonna be the response? Oh no, we're under attack. We better, we better pray the Lord del- delivers us. And It's interesting what they pray, what they say, how they act. They didn't scatter. When the, when the, when the church heard this, they raised their voices in unison, they, together in prayer to God. They said, Sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant David. And our Father, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, the Christ. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your Holy Spirit, Holy Servant Jesus. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. So think about the vanity of empty religion. What, what, did, what did these religious authorities accomplish with all their threats and their political mover, maneuverings and their throwing the apostles in jail and all these things? They achieved none of their goals. They could not shut up Peter and John. They could not stop the people from believing or converting. They were out of control. They were losing. It was great vanity. They were raging in vain. They were arrogant. They were mad. They were empty-hearted, empty-headed, empty-handed. There's no meaningful purpose in them. Their worldview was crumbling and they had nothing to show for it. And they inspired a gorgeous prayer by the Christians. Uh, The word here when it says sovereign Lord is one used only four times in the New Testament and it's one saying the Lord is in absolute control of all things. Absolute control of all things. Why is it important that they pray with that? Because their faith is not shaken. The building's shaken but their faith is not because they trust and believe that the Lord is sovereign over all things. He will not be defeated, and everything happens according to his purpose. So, and, and, and they go on in the prayer to say, even your holy servant Jesus, who was crucified by the, by the authorities, that was according to your will, that he die and rise again and pay for our sins. What a beautiful, inspired prayer that was. Inspired unity, that all the people were together with one voice. It's a, nothing unites us like a common enemy sometimes, right? And, and just these people were galvanized together and what they stood for. And, and this, is actually hope, this is actually really good hope for us today in America. And you never know at what point in time we're gonna start being, I mean, we're already being censored on, on tech and, and things like that. But when we actually start experiencing real persecution, will we respond with this prayer, a sovereign Lord, will we respond in unity and being willing to, to shoulder together and to carry on whatever the costs may be? Will it inspire unity? Will it inspire boldness? And this is what they prayed for. Not make our lives easier or remove the persecution, but Lord, just give us boldness. We understand you're in control that all things happen for a reason. We want to be bold. We want to be found faithful in the midst of all these threats. Give us boldness. And they were filled with boldness. The Lord answered their prayer and the place was shaken. It's a beautiful picture, beautiful picture. By the way, in Psalm 2, this is a royal psalm that's quoted here. Uh, Psalm 2 would often be read at the coronation of the kings of Israel, saying, why do the nations rage in vanity? They've rejected Yahweh. It's all meaningless. And it's a royal, royal psalm saying God's in control. He's gonna be good. And we're gonna follow him and worship the Lord alone. Everyone else around us is gonna, gonna fade away, living in vanity, but we are devoted to the Lord. And so this is, 
not just a royal psalm, but a messianic psalm fulfilled in Jesus. There is a lot of vanity today. Um, I do love, I do love looking at research. And uh, one of the big names that jumps out is that Pew Research is a really well respected um, company has been doing research for a long time. Uh, they did, uh, in 2017, they did a survey of what matters most to people among 17 developed nations. So where do you find meaning in life? Where do you find meaning in life? What do you think they said? 17 de- developed nations, including America, including a lot of Western Europe. Here's a list. This is what they, this is what they believe brought meaning in life. Uh, family. Family's good, right? Um, career. Wealth, uh, community or relationships with others, uh, health, whether it be physical or mental, emotional health, just kind of contributions to society. These are the top uh, six things where, where us and, and civilized, developed countries think that our meaning comes from. And if you look and you scan really carefully all the way down to the second from the bottom, we see just above pets, just a little bit more important than fluffy. Spirituality, faith, and religion at 2% of people believe that that brought ultimate fulfillment or purpose in life. Now the good news is that here in America, 15% of Americans report finding meaning, ultimate value in faith. But just look at this list. All of it goes away except for one. All of it does. That only what we do for Jesus lasts. Everything else is going to die and fade away. So what are we living for? Are we taking a, a, a page from the Pharisees and Sadducees and living for vain purposes? Uh, our family, careers, wealth, community, things like that, they're good things. But should we live for them? No. And this is the message that we're constantly being bombarded with, that we ought to live for these things. Have we bought into it? We've got to be careful because these things are sneaky. We must, n- must know that everything, one day, everything we've ever done will be evaluated by the singular test. Was it in service to the name of Jesus Christ? And everything else is ultimate vanity. So the question, the challenge for us today is, what are we living for? What are you and I living for? Just really encourage us to pray and really take time to evaluate our hearts. It is so easy to to say we've got a Christian or a biblical worldview. And, and it's so easy to, sl- even if we do have one, it's really easy for us to slip out and start acting completely opposite of what we say we believe. It's very hard to live out. We slip. We need God's word. We need the conviction of the Holy Spirit. We need to be filled with the Spirit. We need one another. And the church is so important that we encourage and hold each other accountable to stay on target and to stay on track. We must be living for purpose. We're gonna have a chance to declare with our voices that Jesus is our cornerstone. It's a song we've sung in here a lot. But just think as we sing this song here in a moment to think Jesus is our cornerstone. He is the first stone laid in our lives upon which everything else must fall into place. We're completely, utterly dependent upon him for meaning, for life, for fulfillment, for purpose. And that he's the most important thing. And that come what may, no matter what happens, no matter what threats we might hear in life or the challenges we might face, we will not be shaken because our faith and our trust is in Jesus and service to him and making him known for all eternity. Will you declare that with me? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and for the privilege that we have of, of studying it together this morning. Uh, what a joy it is to look at, at your love for that lame man, uh, the way that you he brought healing to him, Lord, the way that we, we trust that there is healing in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Lord, we, we look at the response of Peter and John. Lord, help us to be like them. Father, I pray that you would keep us away from power politics, that you would help us to take a step back, to be more concerned about the person of Jesus Christ than anyone or anything else. I pray that you'd help us and we might have drifted away from the name of Jesus, living for something else other than that one name. Help bring clarity to our lives, give us wisdom and focus. And Lord, I pray that the worldview that we live in is grounded in you and grounded in your word. 
and eternal things, not temporary things of the earth that are fleeting. Lord, we thank and, and praise you that you gave your son our cornerstone that we might have life, save us from our sin and despair. Give us a hope and a future and a home with you in heaven, not what we deserve, which is judgment and hell. We praise things in Jesus' name. Amen.